Kurt Friesen, District 34, Hamilton, Merrick, Nance, Port of Hall County. Brett Lindstrom, District 18, Northwest Hall. I fled District 19, all of Madison and Southern Pierce County. Tom Breezy, District 41. Joni Albright, District 17, Wayne Thurston, Dakota, and a portion of Dixon County. Today, our pages, we only have one today, so we're going to have to be very nice. Uh, can you stand up, please? Is Kennedy. So she's our only page today. Please remember that the senators may come. I'm sorry, Kennedy is at UNL studying political science. Please remember that senators may come and go during our hearing as they have bills to introduce in other committees. Please refrain from applause or other indications of support or opposition. For our audience, the microphones in the room are not for amplification, but for recording purposes only. Lastly, we use electronic devices to distribute information. Therefore, you may see committee members referencing information on their electronic devices. Please be assured that your presence here today and your testimony are important to us and critical to state government. So that we will start with LB 926, Senator Paul. Thank you, Chairwoman Linehan, members of the committee. My name is Rich Pauls, R I C H P A H L S. <coughs> Today I bring forth LB 926. LB 926 is about equity. Property taxes are the number one issue for many people in Nebraska, and rightly so, because we know they're very high. So what do we do? We try to fix it all with all kinds of credits and valuation schemes. That is good, I say. We probably should not even begin taking the money from the, uh, from the taxpayers in the first place. But it's good that we are addressing property taxes for some, I'm using the word some Nebraskans. Again, I say some Nebraskans, but not all Nebraskans. We're leaving out a full third of the population, 33.9% of Nebraskans rent. That's 286,210 rental units and 664,945 renters. And they do get the honor of paying the property taxes as a portion of their rent. Those figures I, re I get from the uh, 2020 census. So they are up to date. LB 926 is mainly for me a discussion bill. I'm thinking that Senator DeBoer would take the lead on this issue. To me, it's an important issue that we need to have. Every, everyone is looking out for the property taxpayer, who's looking out for the renter that is having that tax pass on to them and does not receive the benefit of a tax credit. And I do understand the concept of supply and demand uh, because of the rent and uh, the, the, the amount of money that the investor has to do into their properties. LB 926 would take care of renters by creating an income tax credit of 2% of the total amount paid in rent the credit would be at least $50, but would be capped at $500. And what I say, I'm using this as a, as a uh, starting point to get some discussion, because if you can say a third of the people, the state of Nebraska, we always talk about this being fair. And you know, my thing down here is for uh, uh, balancing things out. So I, I truly believe a third of the people are not receiving what they could be receiving in the property tax credits. Willing to answer any questions? Okay. Are there questions from the committee? Senator Flood. Yes. Senator Pauls, are you telling us that you want this bill to be IPP'd <laughs> so that we can uh, consider Senator DeBoer? Uh, well, that's a possibility. I think you ought to talk, if that's, that's okay with me, if you uh, pick up uh, the senator who's following me, because it's the same concept, looking out for renters. That would not that would not bother me. I just because we're beginning discussion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Flood. Are there other questions from the committee? Seeing none, you'll be here to close. Thank so, you, Chip. Yes. Okay, excellent. First proponent. Oh yes. Well, let's we'll see how many witnesses we have. Our testimonies. <laughs> Witness. I'm sorry. Uh, are there any proponents? Are there any opponents? 
Is there anyone here wishing to testify in a neutral position? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Senators, and thank you very much. My name is Lynn Fisher, L-Y-N-N-F-I-S-H-E-R. Um, <clears throat> Did you need my address as well? Nope. Okay. And I'm here representing the Statewide Property Owners Association. Uh, here in a neutral capacity, we're actually going to be supporting LB 740 for Senator DeBoer. But uh, this particular uh, bill, as it's written, we're neutral on because it does not exclude from the property or the um, income tax credit those properties who are property tax exempt. And so here, for example, in Lincoln, the Lincoln Housing Authority has millions of dollars worth of property. They don't pay property taxes, yet they rent to uh, fully market, uh, non-subsidized tenants. And we don't believe that if this was to pass, that that would be a fair uh, allocation of credits for people whose properties aren't taxed to begin with. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I, I'm very glad you're here because I wondered about that. So there are a lot of, I don't know. So what if you're a student at the University of Nebraska paying rent for a, I don't know, would that include dorms? I mean, where does this, where's, how do we break this down? Who's? Well, there are lots of property tax exempt properties and the Lincoln Housing Authority is the one major one that we're concerned about because it offers an unfair competition to our industry because they rent to anybody um, and several, many of them, more than half of their properties that are not, um, they don't pay property taxes or sales taxes, yet their, um, their tenants are fully capable of renting anywhere. They're not subsidized at all. Okay. So you're, you're saying if they don't, if the landlord doesn't pay property taxes, then they sh shouldn't get a break. Exactly. Rent. I can't. Any other questions? Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Are there any other people wanting to testify in the neutral position. Do we have letters for the record on this? Grant, do we have any yeah, letters? Okay. We have one proponent, one opponent, and none in neutral. Senator Pauls, would you like to close? Yes, I understand the concern. I was thinking that uh, a nonprofit, but it was not in the bill, it would not, they're not paying money into uh, the tax, so they should not receive uh, taxes. But you do have, you brought some a very good, uh, a good point about the uh, people on campus. I mean, they are renting, but I think. So if we just tighten it up somehow. Probably. No, I understand that. Yeah. So. Any I, other questions for Senator Pauls? Seeing none. Thank, Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it. So with that, we close the hearing on LB 926 and open the hearing on LB 740, Senator DeBoer. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chair Linehan and members of the Revenue Committee. My name is Wendy DeBoer, W-E-N-D-Y-D-E-B-O-E-R, and I represent Legislative District 10 in Northwest Omaha. I'm here this afternoon to introduce LB 740, a bill that creates an income tax deduction for rent paid up to a maximum of $3,000 on an individual's principal place of residence. My purpose in introducing LB 740 is to help address one aspect of our housing issues in Nebraska. In recent years, the cost of housing has been increased, increasing at a higher rate than wages. We know that we don't have enough workers in the state. And when, without enough housing that workers can afford, we can't grow our economy. This bill will help one swath of Nebraskans, even if just a little bit. The data shows, as you heard from the previous bill, that over a third of Nebraska's populations are renters. 
And the Department of Revenue estimates that 257,000 households, 257,000 households will be eligible for this tax credit, or sorry, tax deduction. This isn't a, a large amount of money, but it is a start. And we have to be serious about housing to get serious about our workforce. LB 740 is modeled after a similar law in Indiana. Um, I passed out a handout for you that shows how the law has been working in Indiana. That's from the fiscal office of the Indiana legislature. Um, I will grant you the data is a little bit older uh, from them, uh, but it gives you an idea of how it works. Indiana has had this law in place since 1979 and it continues today. LB 740 allows a taxpayer to deduct from their adjusted gross income rent paid on their residence up to a maximum of $3,000. The tax saving to an individual equals the deduction amount multiplied by their tax rate. As such, the maximum $3,000 deduction in this bill will reduce the state income tax liability by $205.20 if you are in the highest tax bracket. I have a chart that I've also handed out to you that shows how much tax liability would be reduced under each income tax bracket. This is a separate deduction that an individual can take even if they do not itemize on their tax returns. If you do not have any income tax liability in the state of Nebraska, however, you will not be eligible uh, to benefit from this deduction. LB 740 will help make housing more affordable for our taxpayers who do not own their own homes. We have programs to help reducing housing costs for property owners such as the mortgage interest deduction for those who itemize and property tax credit funds. LB 740 will help renters. My district has a large number of renters and I care about the affordability of their housing. This bill addresses a population that is currently missed in our efforts to address our housing crisis. I urge you to advance LB 740 to general file. I'm happy to work with this committee to make any changes that you think would be necessary to make it a better bill. I'm considering this bill for my personal priority, and at this time, I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Are there questions from the committee? Senator Paul. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to make, because I, I, my intent was to start out, but you, did I hear correctly, want to make this a priority if it gets out of committee? If it gets out of committee, it's one of the ones I'm considering, yes. Okay. Thank you. Other questions from the committee? Senator Friesen. Thank you, Chair Roland Monahan. You know, in the past, we've people who rent, like Senator Pauls, have said that uh, our property tax credit doesn't necessarily trickle down to help the tenant. Um, but what would stop the landlord here from raising the rent a little bit, knowing that there's a little relief for you? Is there any? You know, it's it's so easy. Somebody take advantage of this. I've seen it in other tax things we've done. It's uh, the, the landlord could raise rent ten dollars a month and recoup some of this. And... Yeah, I mean, I'm, I I admit there's probably a possibility that that could happen. Um, I would hope that the market would uh, take care of that issue. Um, we know that rents are very susceptible to market forces, so I would hope that that would take care of it. Recently, too, like in Hall County, we had a case where you know apartment buildings were undervalued by. 200%, they increased their valuation suddenly. So, I mean, those apartment dwellers were getting quite a break, it's the tenants, landlords. Um, the one indicated he was raising his rent $45 a month um, now that his valuation's where they belong. Um, and I think that's more widespread than we think. Um, I know this kind of compensates because it, it's got a cap on it, but at some point it doesn't come close to covering a $45 a month increase if those apartments were valued where they should be. Um, I'm kind of torn between trying to do something like this, but again, it seems like people can take advantage of it, and I don't I don't know that it gets, in the end, gets to where it belongs. Yeah, well, I don't have information on how many apartment buildings in this state are undervalued and sort of where that would change and all of that. I just, I don't have that information. But you. if you had it, I'd be happy to look at it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Friesen. Any other questions from the committee? 
Seeing none, will you stay close? I will. Okay. First proponents for LB740. Lynn Fisher, L-Y-N-N-F-I-S-H-E-R, representing the Statewide Property Owners Association. And we're here um, to support this bill and this effort. Uh, we want to <clears throat> see that all of our customers, our tenants, are able to get some relief, if, if possible, through this, uh, this type of a, a bill. Uh, we try our best to keep the rents as low as possible. Uh, to answer your question, Senator Friesen, the market dictates what we're able to uh, charge for rent. Uh, those rents are constrained by the marketplace. It's not <clears throat> always possible for us to raise rents as much as we would like in order to keep our places relatively full. Um, so, you know, if we keep raising the rents, obviously we'll have vacant units and then, then our, our revenues actually decrease. So the market forces certainly do come into play in terms of controlling what can be charged for rent. And it varies a lot depending on location and real estate, you know, location and, and condition and, and market conditions fluctuate all the time. Right now, fortunately, um, you know, vacancy rates are in the last several years quite low because there's a shortage of, of, uh, of good properties for folks that are interested in trying to find a good quality property. Um, but we want to give uh, any opportunity to our, our tenants and our customers to get some relief and it just helps them because we've had to raise rents. We've had to because of property tax increases, <clears throat> inflationary pressures on all of our expenses and overhead in, in order for us to maintain a small profit, we need to be able to raise those rents whenever we can for those reasons. But we, I can't imagine a situation where um, we or any of our members of our association would see this as an opportunity if it passed to be able to raise the rent for this sole purpose only. I mean, that just wouldn't, certainly wouldn't be uh, fair or ethical. And the market would uh, um, certainly have something to say about that too, in terms of how much rents are raised anyway. But I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Fisher. Are there questions from the committee? Senator Friesen? Thank you, Chairwoman Minahan. So like this next year, when you file your income taxes, you're gonna be able to get back and, and be in Lincoln here, your dollar five tax levy you'll get back 25% of what you pay your school in taxes. Right. Uh, does anyone pass that on to the tenant? Has anybody ever lowered rents a little bit? Well, our property tax uh, taxes have increased far more than that credit will be. So I, we I get that, but this is going to increase four times fold from what we were, and there's going to be a pretty large refund that's going to go to the homeowners. Well, the, the net effect, though, is our property taxes are going up, even with the credit. So they won't be going up as much as this refund. Well, I would love to show you our tax bills compared to the last couple of years. Uh, our members are just screaming because of the, uh, the amount of tax increases that we've seen on our properties. And that's the reason why we've had to raise rents. Okay. Do you feel your apartment buildings are fairly uh, assessed in value? Yes. It's pretty well market value. Yes. Yeah. And they have been going up quite a bit. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator Friesen. Senator Pauls. Thank you. I lease, so I understand. Uh, I have to be honest with you. And I live in a, a nice place, nothing unusual. But my rates have gone up. I know it's compensated for any tax increase. I can tell you that personally. Sure. Uh, another question I have is, my uh, I have to have fire, you know, protection, fire protection for my belongings, my stuff. But now I'm finding out that I'm paying, and those of us in my complex, we're paying the fire, the insurance for the building. Is that is that typical? Well, I don't know if you're paying it directly or if it's just part of the rent covering the overhead of the of the owner. But that, that's what we do. We have property insurance, and that's part of our, our structure for overhead that we have to decide how much above that do we need for rent to cover for those expenses. We do, however, uh, require renter's insurance, yes, that if that's what you're referring to. Um, which is which is very important. Well, I was just surprised a couple of years ago I started seeing my lease, and then this is what it costs plus additional rent, which oh. I, or uh, insurance. So they're charging you a fee for renter's insurance, separate for, for their building. Right, I well, paid my own. 
Well, I, I guess I don't know what your situation is and what your what your. I'm just I'm just curious. I didn't know if that's common practice, and, uh, and I'm not. I'm not. I'm not familiar with a separate charge for for rent or for insurance. Okay. I'm not. Other questions from the committee. Following up on Senator Paul's, if you own a building, you're gonna make sure you have the insured the building. Of course, insured, right? of course. Yeah. yeah, but what you're saying is sometimes you require them to have. Fire insurance for, for their belongings well, and the apartment. Yeah. We require renter's insurance, renters. which is covers their own personal belongings, but it offers a, a, also a liability uh, coverage for them in case they negligently cause a fire or flood, and that will give us some protection. We can make a claim against the renter's insurance so that we don't have to have that claim against our policy, I other see. than the deductible sometimes. I see. Okay, other questions? Thank you very Thank much you. for being here. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Other proponents? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, um, Madam Chairwoman, Senator, and committee members. I just, um, I just support this bill, and uh, it's just, you know, I, I, well, just first of all, I think that market forces will. Did you say your name and spell your oh, name? Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> My name is Joey Litwinowitz, J-O-B-Y-L-I-T-W-I-N-O-W-I-C-Z. And my phone number, no, I'm just kidding, but. Just need uh, your name. Huh? We just need your name. I was kidding. Oh, okay. <laughs> and um, anyway, uh, oh, I, I don't mean, um, I don't mean to waste time. I believe that market forces, first of all, will take care of it. In Lincoln, I read the, uh, the city report. I live in Lincoln. And uh, there's so little housing. There's so much competition. That, I, that On that case, I, I can't imagine that being a problem. Because I'm, I'm familiar with it. I read the book. And, I mean, it is like a book. And it's huge. Um, and just for this location of Lincoln. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think I just... From the, uh, it seems like if we can't do, okay, let me finish. Um, it just seems that there's got to be a way to help the little guy out. Um, and it's interesting, just the body language, and you know, uh, I don't mean to be, um, but when you mention, you know, well, but what, what about, uh, well, they'll do this or they'll do that, but we're losing sight of the focus that we should. Uh, instead of like, uh, well, coming up with easy ways to, to shoot it down is to figure it out. And um, that's just the feeling I got. So using the rules of a happy marriage, I feel that there was an atmosphere like that here. And um, uh, as far as the housing authority goes, you know, they, they do so much um, in Lincoln that, uh, you know, uh, we're so short on housing in, in, this, in this town for the, uh, uh, people uh, like me, well, I'm on disability, I get subsidized, but I mean, uh, there's so little housing that, um, you know, let's let them build wherever, you know, um, and so, uh, that, you know, uh, that's all I have to say, and uh, I just wanted people to think about that, and uh, I know it's easy to say to find another way to pay schools, but we shouldn't, you know, yeah, I, you know, I don't know what to say about that, but, um, you know, just to, uh, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much right. for being here. Are there any questions from the committee? Okay. Thank you very much for being yeah. here. Appreciate it. Yeah. Other proponents? Good 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Alan Duggar, A-L-A-N-D-U-G-G-E-R. I'm a student attorney for the Civil Clinic at Nebraska Law. I'm testifying and speaking in support of LB 740 in my capacity as a student of the law and a lifelong tenant. In Nebraska, there's a considerable disparity in how, in how homeowners and owners are treated under the law, including under the tax code. Unlike homeowners, there are no real economic incentives for renters in general. Renters rebuild equity, and even in the highest tax brackets can't claim any deductions for, for, for mortgage interest, for example. There's a need for parity here. I, I echo uh, Mr. Fisher's comments earlier about a need for relief for his tenants. The fair market price for a two bedroom rental in Nebraska is just under $900 per month. According to the National Low Income, Low Income Housing Coalition, the minimum hourly wage needed here in Nebraska to afford a two bedroom rental for a family is $17 per hour. That's $3 below the average minimum wage for a renter, the average wage for a renter in Nebraska. Plenty of Nebraskans are hanging on by the margins, and LB740 could really make a difference there. As a Nebraska citizen and renter, I support LB740 in its attempt to correct that imbalance. Uh, I want to go script for a little bit. I can tell you, so part of what I do is I, I volunteer in eviction defense, and we see tenants all the time at court who are just one month behind in rent. And we're always able to help them, but I, I wonder how much, how much of an impact might any kind of money in their pockets. I mean, most, most Americans even don't even have $500 saved up. One month of rent stands to you an eviction, even a small amount of money, $200, even less, can prevent that, hold it off, allow a family to buy groceries. LB740 makes good economic sense. It directly benefits all renters. A full third of Nebraskans, as Senator Paul has mentioned earlier, a predominantly low income third. It puts money back in their pockets a third of Nebraskans need it most. Our tax system is regressive. Nebraskans earning the lowest 20% of income wind up paying the highest amount of taxes proportionate to that income. I think any measure that eases that burden on low-income families and one that rewards economic activity rather than simply shifting the burden to a higher tax bracket should find support in our legislature. As a final point, Senator Barber's legislation could not be more timely. The average Nebraskan renter already struggles to afford running a home for a family, and rent prices are only going up. The Federal, the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas has, has projected that rent inflation will rise up to 6.9% by December 2023, right when LB740 would take effect. Even outside of our urban centers, rents are on the rise. Renters and their families need help, and this legislature is poised to step in. I respectfully urge you to do so. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Duggar? Seeing that, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Uh -huh. Are there other proponents? Are there any opponents? Anyone wanting to testify in the neutral position? We did have uh, four proponents submit testimony and one opponent and no one in the neutral position. So if I could, uh, Senator DeBoer, would you like to close? <laughs> Thanks, Senator Linehan, uh, and thank you to members of the committee. I don't really have a lot to add at this time because uh, it was a relatively short uh, hearing, but I will reiterate that I am willing to uh, make adjustments and work with the committee if they have concerns and would like to make changes or modifications in order to make the bill better. So with that, I'll take any last questions. Did you ask the fiscal office at all about the revenue of the fiscal note? Uh, no, I, I know sometimes we don't have time. I, I get that. I'm having a hard time wrapping. Okay, so worse, I agree with the assumption from the young man from law school that he's probably the lowest, lower income people that are renters. Not always, obviously. Not always. So, so Paul's rents. It's not always. I think about renting when it's, it snows. I get the people rent. <laughs> but the majority, I would think, aren't paying a great deal of income taxes. If they're, I just, the fiscal note seems pretty high to me. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 257,000 families. And if you're filing jointly, then it would be, you know, one, not both incomes, but one. So 257,000 families, I, I mean, I can ask about it. 
Well, I would just ask for the breakdown, what, what they use as a breakdown on income levels, because all 257,000 aren't paying income taxes, because some of them are getting, and I'm not saying it's not right, but they get earned income tax credits, they file and get money back. So it's just, I find, I find it. I mean, if the fiscal note is smaller, better. Yay. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> So, any other questions from the committee? Senator Boster. Thank you, Chairman Ann. Thank you, Senator DeBoer. Um, I actually agree with uh, Senator Linehan that it strikes me as a very high fiscal note. And so I think it would be helpful to the committee if we could uh, look into that and figure out uh, how they arrived at the number they did. The other question I had was related to the fiscal note, which is uh, you have two fiscal notes is the only difference uh, just their characterization in the language in revision 00 that they refer to as a tax credit and then they edited that? Is that the only change? I see your... Uh, your... Yes, it looks like the answer is yes to that question. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to check uh, yeah. if there was anything else that I was missing. Yeah, that. I didn't see any difference. In fact, I thought it was just printed out twice. Thank you very much. Because it's a deduction, not a credit. Correct. So it's not refundable. So Correct. you have to pay income. Yeah, you need to. It may be too high. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, close hearing on, I read the letters, so close hearing on LB 740. Okay, then who's taking over? Senator Rezi. Either, either way. I don't care. High risk, Tom, because when well, I asked Tom, Senator Reese was freezing on here yet. You <laughs> doing? Senator Reese is going to do it. Now we'll open the hearing on LB 938. Chairwoman Linehan, welcome. Cheers. I'm sorry, Kennedy. Good afternoon, Vice Chairman Lindstrom and members of the Revenue Committee. My name is Lou Ann Linehan, L O U A N N L I N E H A N, and I'm here to introduce LB 938. This bill continues the reduction in corporate income taxes that was started last session with LB 432. As you may recall, LB 432 was amended on the floor to slow down the reduction in the rate and wait to see if the state was fiscally sound enough to continue the reduction. Well, here we are one year later and we all know that we're in great fiscal shape. Uh, the state is fiscally sound, so it's time to continue the reduction of top corporate rate. This bill would reduce the top corporate rate from 781 to 584 by year tax year 2026. The rate for the first 100,000 of taxable income remains at 5.58%. This is a companion bill to LB 939, which will be up next. The overarching goal of this bill is to reduce our top marginal tax rate for both corporate and individual income taxes to 5.84%. Achieving this goal will do several things for the state of Nebraska. It creates parities between corporations and flow-through entities. It's more competitive. We have better rankings. The map I just handed out shows. Uh, we, we do better. It makes us more attractive. It helps attract more businesses and more talented people to fill our open jobs. It allows taxpayers to keep more of their money. It has a multiplier effect when residents spend the extra money in the state. If corporations have less income tax to pay, some tax incentives may go unused, we could hope. If you have any questions, please ask me. Thank you. And I do want to comment on the fiscal note because I talked to the fiscal office at noon today. Um, so they go with the revenue department's average annual growth. So when they do a fiscal note for tax cuts, they assume our annual growth in revenue is going to be 5% a year. And over the last three or four years, it's been above 5%, way above in a couple of cases. But so when we look at these, when we look at the cost on this, I just think because, you know, when we're on the floor, we're talking about the out years maybe being, I don't know, I think there's a discussion going on what the out years should be. I think right now 
the fiscal office has them at 0 0.7%, 0 0.7, so 0 0.7 in our growth. But when they do the fiscal notes to cut taxes, they're using a 5% growth. So with that, I'll take any questions. Okay, thank you for your opening. Any questions of Senator Linehan? Seeing none, thank you. First proponent testifier. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. Chair Breezy and the members of the committee. Um, my name is Brian Sloan, B-R-Y-A-N-S-L-O-N-E. I'm the president of the Nebraska Chamber. I'm here on behalf of the Nebraska Chamber, the Greater Omaha Chamber, and the Lincoln Chamber today uh, in support of, of this legislation. Um, let me just hit a few high points. One, uh, it's been a long two years. Uh, it's been a long two years for all of you. It's been a long two years in the business community. Um, unfortunately, if, if I were to bring my employers in the room they, today, they would tell you that the, the uh, hardest work is in front of us, not behind us. Um, as we come out of the pandemic, the, the issue of dealing with a brand new economy with a different work, workforce structure, different cost structure, and the need for technology and innovation um, in all of our core industries, including ag, manufacturing, construction, engineering, transportation, and, and finance, um, is significant. The challenges are significant. And whether it's workforce or technology, <laughs> companies and implementations, um, sorry, um, we're going to be competing with each of the 50 states. And that, that level of competition is, is, is genuinely different than it was before the pandemic. Um, this bill um, is one of what I would say is a handful of game-changing differences that, that this body could could take on this year to truly make Nebraska competitive uh, coming out of the pandemic and help our communities and and our our uh, state thrive and compete coming out of this. To give you a flavor of, of what this corporate tax rate means uh, competitively, um, it would finally put us in the top 20, although it would be 20th, um, assuming no other state lowers their corporate rate. It would make us the 20th uh, from, from the lowest rate. Uh, we're not in the top 20 right now. Um, we are not a, a competitive rate at, rate at all. Um, if I were to list states that, that uh, have lower rates than, than we do at this point, it would be Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Hawaii, Idaho, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan. Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, New Mexico, North Carolina, North Dakota, Ohio, Oklahoma, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, Virginia, and West Virginia, all with lower corporate tax rates than we have. Um, this continuation, and, and I want to I want to thank uh, Senator Linehan for, for bringing this legislation, is critical to the competitiveness of our state, um, and also solves another problem, which we've talked about before, which is parity with the individual rate. Um, just to remind everyone, uh, income on corporations is taxed twice, not once. It's taxed once at the corporate tax rate, and then again for, for ultimately the shareholders to receive that income, it's taxed again at the individual rate. So this is just the beginning of, of how corporate income tax is taxed. In, in a sensible tax policy, you would always never have the corporate rate above the individual rate, and many times you would have it below the individual rate um, as a consequence to stay competitive. Um, I'm very confident in the, in the game-changing capability of this to, to bring um, something that's really important to the state. Uh, if I look at ag, the future of ag is technology. Um, when I look at manufacturing, the future of manufacturing is technology. We need technology companies here in Nebraska, and we need to attract them. Um, unfortunately, we rank in the bottom 10 in attracting those kinds of companies to the state. It's key to our core industries. It's key as we go forward. So I see this as a very positive bill, um, and our chamber members are, are very, very supportive of this bill. This is one of the key things we can do this year to truly make a difference uh, going forward. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. 
Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Senator Bostar. Thank you, Senator Breezy. Thank you, Mr. Sloan. We'd spoken over the interim sort of about taxes in general, mm -hmm. and I had the question of um, what share of our corporate income taxes originate outside of Nebraska? And I just, I was just wanted to follow up and see if you uh, had any other information about that. So um, I better be careful. Your legal counsel is a much greater expert on these subjects than, than I am. But, but generally speaking, in terms of what originates outside of Nebraska, the way that the uh, tax code is set up is that all of the corporate tax income, uh, with one exception, one very notable exception, uh, is related to activities for things that have nexus to Nebraska uh, that, that we collect. We don't collect for activities generally. It's, um, there are a couple notable and one particular exception uh, for which there's other legislation, but uh, it's beyond the scope of this year. Sure, right? I mean, it's, you know, and these have a business presence here, uh, but, but fundamentally originating from corporations and individuals associated with corporations that aren't here. Uh, so, so the activity that generates the income is related here, and you're correct. There are lots of companies. I, I, I will use Kawasaki and Lincoln as an example. That's clearly a Japanese company, um, but it's one of our largest manufacturers in the state. It's one of our largest employers in the state, and the corporate tax that Kawasaki pays in Nebraska relates to the activities that are here in Nebraska. But so... And thank you for uh, having this conversation. The taxes that Kawasaki pays is related directly to the apportionment of their sales within Nebraska. Mm -hmm. So if their sales stay flat, we lower our corporate rate. That isn't necessarily an incentive for them to come and invest more in building up a manufacturing another manufacturing plant in Nebraska because fundamentally if they're if they're selling in the same national landscape they are today it won't make a difference is that correct it depends in in terms of the where the sales take place um, let's just say that their their sales picture doesn't change it it, it like i say it, it depends upon where the sales take place and the mix of, of what they produce um generally speaking um beyond beyond the, the, the sales of, of any of these companies, they also have other headquarters activities associated with it. Um, and but but you're correct that to the extent that they're they're making sales in other places, um, it, it will it will be allocated to those other places. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Senator I, 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 I should add, Senator Bozer, we also have a number of very large percentage of our corporations that, that just sell in Nebraska. Of course. course. Okay. Thank you, Senator Bolstar. Anyone else? Senator Paul. Thank you. Just recently, we had a bill in front of us that the uh, chamber was had a conditional acceptance of it. Hmm. And, and explain to me why that was conditional. I'm just curious. Which bill was, were you referring to, Senator Cameron? The one on property tax. Yeah, so um, we will um, you will hear me testify, and I probably will testify yet again this session uh, at a hearing uh, with a conditional support. It will mean that that we support the the uh, general approach and 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 goals of the bill, but there are certain pieces of the bill that that would be problematic that we think need additional work and, and drafting. Um, in this case, this is not one of those bills. Um, it's, this is one of those situations where uh, there's a, a very simple, small bill um, that will have a mega impact for this state and our ability to compete against the other 49 states and build jobs, uh, not only in, in our metropolitan areas, but in, in our smaller communities. Thank you, Senator Pauls. Anyone else? Senator Breezy. Thank you, Senator Breezy. Um, I'm gonna go back and talk about the corporate Senator Bostar started a little bit with. So, well, I mean, let's use um, Kawasaki. Mm -hmm. I, you know, let's assume they just made streetcars and that's mm -hmm. all they did. Mm -hmm. So their sales were all in some other state because we don't have streetcars. Okay. 
do they have to pay any Nebraska state income tax on those sales? To the extent the sales are made in Nebraska, yes, to the extent they aren't. So for instance, um, and let me use an ag example. Yes. Um, and then let me use like a John Deere, which is the opposite, yes. which is not a Nebraska company with very substantial operations and sales in Nebraska. And as you know, there's a lot of those sales are repair parts as well. And the question is where are those repair parts sourced? And generally in that case, they're going to be sourced with the local That's dealer. kind of where I was going. You've got two different corporate situations. One is right. out of state earning money here. Mm -hmm. And so what they earn here mm -hmm. off of selling the parts, they pay Nebraska taxes. Now they could put that understand and that's a good example of the competitive issue 45% um, of our population and 45% of our, our businesses are within a 40 mile range of a border and so they could just as well put that dealer in South Dakota or a lot of a lot of the areas in the state or Council Bluffs or or I'm, somewhere I'm else almost driving that far already so. I understand I understand but this is this is the issue we are in competition against our, all of our neighboring states um, for activity and having sales occur in this state. And uh, when you have uh, higher rates than, than most of our competitors, um, it causes this question of where you locate your sales uh, to be not Nebraska, if, if there's a practical alternative. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Friesen. Senator Albright. Thank you very much. Um, with the map that Senator uh, Linehan put out, and we have competition all around us. You had mentioned that when you started to talk. How, when we have these incentive packages, mm -hmm. obviously we have those because we have to do some heavy negotiating to get them to come to our state. So um, in reducing this, if we should be able to do so, um, how would that affect um, our bargaining power? Would we have to have all yeah. these major incentives? As yeah, very, very, very question, Senator. Um, and I don't mean to give you a lawyerly answer, in the, but the answer is yes and no in this case, which is the yes answer is uh, we're forced um, to have That's significant it. incentive packages in this state because both our individual and our corporate tax rate are, are some of the higher in the country. Uh -huh. and, and that is just what it is. Um, so presumably, if you had a lower rate, you would be at a different competitive standard and, and you would be able to change your incentive packages appropriately. I will say, though, that even in states like Texas, which has no income tax whatsoever, they have incentive packages for certain things they're trying to create. And I'll give you an example. Um, I do believe this technology issue is core to the development of our core industries. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, whether it's ag or manufacturing or banking and finance or even construction or transportation. Mm -hmm. um, this ability to attract technology entrepreneurs, which our state has not been particularly good at, um, but is, is sort of core to our growth going forward and our ability to attract and keep 18 to 34 year olds in the state uh, really means the ability to, to bring in companies that, that, that bring in game changing ag tech manufacturing tech, fintech, whatever. Um, and I could conceive in that case, you might come up with a different kind of incentive program for, for those kinds of things, or even, even other expansions of existing core businesses here. But it would be on a case-by-case -case basis rather than having to do a, a, a broad, big tax incentives program. Okay, then just one more question. So since we are bordering to two states that have no income tax or corporate income tax, mm -hmm. When they come into our state, are they doing business with us and then later go to one of the neighboring states to have a headquarters so they can avoid um, our corporate income tax? And if they were to do that, yeah. after you've already negotiated a package deal with them, what would you do? Well, those deals are dependent upon, as you, as you know, those, those incentive deals are dependent upon maintaining a certain employee base and investment base in the state. And if there are recapture provisions around that. Um, I will say that the, the key to headquarters uh, has been my experience is will be the next bill, uh, which is the individual tax bill, which is okay. historically Nebraska has been blessed with, with corporate headquarters. We've seen some leave, 
Um, our biggest competitor for corporate headquarters right now seems to be Texas, which has zero income tax. Um, but that will be the next bill, and I, I will address that issue Great. in the Thank next you. bill. Senator Albright, and Bolster. Thank you, Senator Breeden. Um, I promise I'll, I'll be done soon, Mr. Sloan. Um, so you talked about the idea of you know a large national corporation setting up a dealership, for example, John Deere, mm -hmm. in a in a border, you know, right across the border, in order to avoid those sales being apportioned to within Nebraska at a higher rate. So, you know, the vast majority of our population is on the eastern side of the state. Right across the border of Iowa is a significantly higher rate, and right across the border toward Missouri is a significantly lower rate. So I guess what I'm interested in knowing is are we seeing, and I, don't, I have no idea what the answer is, are we seeing large corporations set up branch offices, dealers, things like that, um, right on, across the border on our side when they are talking about proximity to Iowa? And are we, is there a large development of these kinds of businesses in that northwestern corner of Missouri where they can they can apportion sales at the 4% rate and avoid our 7.5, I think is going to be 7.25, uh, and Iowa's 9.8. Is that, if I went to that area of Missouri, am I going to find a lot of locations for large uh, national corporations? So I'll give you an example that I would recommend. I, um, I'm not a, a, uh, as familiar with Northwest Missouri as I probably should be. Um, Nor am I. A couple of motorcycle rides, but beyond that, I don't. Can't tell you much. Um, I am very familiar with Sioux Falls. Um, Sioux Falls is one of the fastest growing communities in the country. Um, and it is largely because of that two things, really a 0% uh, tax rate, both on business and individuals, and two, um, some very significant community leadership uh, in that community. That's a, that's a perfect mix. Um, and you see it in healthcare, you see it in FinTech, um, you see in technology, you can see in an agribusiness. Uh, um, it's growing much faster than any of our Nebraska communities at this point. And so it, it, do, it, is, it absolutely does happen. And we have two states that border us, to the earlier comment, that have zero percent income tax. And we have Kansas and Colorado to deal with as well. And I, I'm a Western Nebraska kid. And so our competition out there is Denver. Thank you, Senator Bolstar. Thank you. Anyone else? We, we have a fiscal note here, and it shows us the price tag of doing that. But we're talking about enhancing our business climate, correct? Mm -hmm. There's going to be some positive impacts to state coffers from enhancing that climate, correct? Mm -hmm. That aren't reflected here. They're not reflected. So we don't use any dynamic scoring at, at all in our revenue forecasts. And, and so they're not really geared to, to, to demonstrate that. Um, and this goes, this goes back as far as blueprint, but, but truly, and you've heard me on this theme today, but I truly do believe the ability to attract technology companies is key to the ability to attract 18 to 34 year olds, which is key to our ability to continue to, to fund economic growth and not only the functions of government, um, but the, uh, the ability to provide tax relief, whether that's income tax relief or property tax relief. I, I see this as a necessary component in that process. Thank, thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no other questions, thank you for your testimony, Mr. Thank Small. you very much. Next proponent testifier. Good afternoon and welcome. Acting Chair, members of the committee, my name is Jerry Stilmock, J-E-R-R-Y-S-T-I-L-M-O-C-K, testifying on behalf of the National Federation of Independent Business, as well as Nebraska Bankers Association in support of the legislation. I've listened intently to what Senator Linehan has uh, shared with you, what Mr. Sloan has shared with you. Um, I'm not going to read from my remarks because they're somewhat competitive, uh, repetitive, and the first paragraph simply restates what the legislation would do, so I'm not going to waste your time. 
in that regard, other than to say uh, my closing paragraph is it creates uh, uh, parity among the businesses, no matter what the entity choice is by the business. And uh, I, I think the biggest thing that, that, that Senator Linehan said that I would repeat with your indulgence is uh, um, to, to keep and maintain taxpayers in Nebraska and bring more here. The resounding cry is workforce. And um, if, if the belief by you is, it doesn't have to be by, I'm, I'm not a salesperson, I'm, I'm supporting the position of my two clients. But if the belief is that uh, reducing the, the corporate tax rate will bring more business, uh, will bring, uh, therefore bring more people, um, that's, that's a goal that, that we've heard no matter what retail area you go to, no matter, no matter if you're going out to eat or shopping or whatever, whatever the retail is, it's workforce. And if this is to attract more businesses to come to Nebraska, um, I, I guess you all, as the, as the policy makers, which, go, which comes first? And it's our belief that this would assist. And uh, for the reasons that, that I've tried to outline for you, we'd uh, ask you to consider uh, moving this bill on to the general file. Thank you, Senators. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Thanks, Senator Breezy. Mr. Stelbach, good to see you. You as well. Um, first of all, I think that um, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, I think it's a tough priority for certainly everyone here to attract a workforce, attract businesses, grow the state. Um, and I think that you know all these conversations are ultimately about trying to, with confidence, identify the absolute best ways to do that. Um, so that being said, you talked about parity, and, and that's, that comes up a lot. And, you know, we can make the rates look the same as far as the number, but depending on your, your business financial positioning, um, a, trying to get a pass-through and a C-Corp to pay the same amount of taxes is really you can you can you can peg a target depending on their revenue, but as soon as the revenue of that changes, you're going to be out of balance again, right? Because at the federal level, the way that your your deduction structure works is uh, is fundamentally different. So we, we can make the rates the same, but a company with the same revenue that's a pass through in a C corp won't necessarily have the same state corporate tax or even individual tax liability. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? You know, I, I understand your comments, sir. And, and uh, <laughs> this is one time where I can say, I'm no accountant, right? I'm an attorney, so I'm gonna flip it just a hair. Uh, I, I don't know that I could even even comment to the, to the breadth of, of uh, your policy statement, sir. I respect your policy statement, but um, uh, if I understood, if I may, um, different factors go into the, the C corp taxation than go than what go into the uh, uh, personal property tax, personal income tax. Excuse me. And there are going to be differences in the computation of those two taxes. So you're recognizing that there are different factors that that should be considered as as your side of the table and policy considerations. Um, I'm acknowledging your point, but I don't know if I can take it any further than that, sir. Thank you very much. I appreciate your question or your comment and my <laughs> offer to try to answer it. Thank you, Senator Bostar. Any other questions of the committee? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Very Mr. well. Thank you, Senators. <clears throat> Next proponent testifier. Anybody wanting to testify, feel free to move up to the front. Good afternoon and welcome. Rush to the front, right? Uh, good afternoon, members of the Revenue Committee. My name is Bud Seinhorst, B-U-D-S-Y-N-H-O-R-S-T. I'm president and CEO of the Lincoln Independent Business Association. We represent over a thousand businesses here in the Lincoln Lancaster County uh, community. We're here today to support LB 938 and also 
uh, could share these sentiments on the next bill, 939. Uh, several of our, our points have been reiterated by uh, previous testifiers. I just want to reiterate the high corporate income, corporate and income tax rates are detrimental to the impact on our economy, reduce the amount of money in our businesses' hands uh, to pay their workers and grow their businesses. The workforce issues are very real that uh, Mr. Sloan spoke about earlier. And uh, currently we rate the 35th on the Tax Foundation's State Business Tax Climate Index. We can do better as a state, and I hope we can do better. These measures presented today will assist in a larger mission of attracting and retaining businesses and talent to our state. By becoming more competitive in the tax arena, we send the right message that we are open for business. Um, as business and owners attempt to navigate out of the uncertainty brought, up, brought on by the past two years and having dealt with things like closures, restrictions, et cetera, it's time that we have to be imperative that our policies produce an environment of opportunity and reflect a growth mindset. Uh, this bill, we believe, reflects that mindset. And for these reasons, uh, we urge the advancement of both 938 and 939 on to general file, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Seinhorst. Any uh, questions? Thank you very Seeing much. None, thank you for your testimony. Next proponent testifier. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Jessica Shelburne, J-E-S-S-I-C-A-S-H-E-L-B-U-R-N. I'm the State Director of Americans for Prosperity, Nebraska. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak on this today. Uh, as you know, we have always been in support of lowering our tax rates. Um, this committee has heard a lot of proposals over the years, and this is one proposal that we fully stand behind. We would like to see it go a little bit lower, maybe. Um, but we really appreciate uh, Senator Linehan bringing this bill and hope that you guys will move it forward. I'm not going to repeat everything that folks have said. Um, there's no need. But with that, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you again. Thank you. Next proponent testifier. Any testifiers in the opposition? <clears throat> Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. Chairman Breezy, <clears throat> members of the Revenue Committee. My name is Craig Beck, that's C-R-A-I-G-B-E-C-K, and I'm the Senior Fiscal Analyst at Open Sky Policy Institute. We're here today in opposition to LB 938 because the corporate income tax cuts proposed in the bill would mostly flow to wealthy non-Nebraskans, and this would be on top of the generous tax breaks we already provide for corporations. Further, the bill also would cut general fund revenues for services that actually benefit Nebraskans and our economy. First, the vast majority of benefits from the proposed corporate income tax reduction, when fully implemented, would flow to non-Nebraskans. LB 938 would cut more than $53 million from the state's base in fiscal year 26, yet an insignificant amount of that would end up in the pockets of Nebraska taxpayers. Estimates of how much the cut will flow out of state range from 83% to over 90%, with the more conservative estimate coming from the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy, or ITEP. Under their conservative estimate, Nebraska's corporations would be left splitting at most about $9 million of this tax cut, with the other $44 million benefiting residents of other states. That means the wealthiest 1%, of Nebraskans would see an average tax cut of just $436, which is such a small percentage of that group's income that it actually rounds to zero in our modeling. It's still far greater than the $5 average tax cut that's seen by the 80% of taxpayers making less than $125,000. Second, Nebraska's corporations are already afforded generous state subsidies through tax incentives. Nebraska's two largest tax incentives, LB-775 and Nebraska Advantage, have provided corporate tax relief to the tune, corporate tax relief, to the tune of nearly $1.2 billion through corporate income tax reductions alone, which doesn't include any benefits that might have been paid out due to Imagine Nebraska. 
In fact, those two programs have abated more than $4.2 billion in total state taxes, and that doesn't include the property taxes that have been abated under these programs. Furthermore, LB 938 would do little to help small businesses. The median income of self-employed individuals at their own incorporated business was $43,040 in 2018. Such a business would not receive a tax cut under LB 938. The revenue losses created by the proposal, however, would impede Nebraska's ability to invest in real economy builders like schools, public safety, and infrastructure, and also would prevent Nebraska from taking real steps to address our high reliance on property taxes to fund schools and other vital services. Finally, I'd like to note that we're in a, uh, an economic period of significant uncertainty. There is a risk that we are in the middle of a financial bubble and we'll see revenues drop if it bursts. We also don't know the extent to which federal funds are supporting our economy and face the prospect of the federal government clawing back some of the ARPA money if it's improperly spent. We therefore recommend caution when considering proposals that would cause ongoing revenue losses. Uh, before I end here, I do just wanna make one quick comment about um, the uh, suggestion that corporate income taxes amount to double taxation. Um, you know, uh, from our perspective, corporations are afforded a litany of exemptions. Uh, they, they also are subject to a significant amount of tax incentives, as you all well know. Um, and uh, again, a considerable amount of corporate income goes to tax exempt entities such as retirement funds, educational institutions and religious organizations. And so with that, uh, for those reasons, we oppose LB 938 and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions, Senator Pauls? I'm looking at the chart. Yes. I see 83% uh, out of state. Um, what is the, the exact number other than percentage? How many, how many, you said number of non, non Nebraskans, I like to know, you know like say 500, 1,000, uh, okay, so. Oh, is this dollar and minus interpret that? Yes, this is the benefits of the corporate tax cut proposed under LB 938 that would flow out of state okay. to out of state taxpayers. Correct. Yes, and and again, that that's a conservative estimate on the low end. We have estimates up to upwards of ninety percent. So. Thank you, Senator Paul. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you for your testimony. Next opponent testifier. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, uh, Vice Chairman Brizzy and committee. Um, I just wanted to mention, I know of oh, my name. That's what I wanted to mention. Uh, my name is Joey Litwinowitz, J-O-E-Y-L-I-T-W-I-N-O-W-I-C-Z-M-O-U-S-E. <laughs> anyway. Uh, good, good afternoon again. I just, um, I, I, man, the problems of uh, getting companies to come to Nebraska are difficult. And it started by a nationwide trend of everybody, of the corporate, of corporate uh, America, you know, just absolutely. Um, I know there's competition uh, everywhere. And, and I'm not, it's interesting. Economics is fascinating to me. But uh, uh, the problem is, is that this is starting and it's going everywhere. So uh, that's the problem. That's the focus is to stop that. Um, I know we, I don't know how we can, but but the, to decrease, uh, I mean, you know, it's irritating when they talk about federal tax rates. You know, they pay between seven and eleven percent. You know, come on, if they're not taxed any higher than that, and some of them uh, get money back. And those are the bigger ones. And we have different sized companies in Nebraska, of course. But my suggestion is that, is that we use the, uh, 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 the, we raise or send that money. Uh, let's, um, let's give that money uh, so that we can, um, last bill, uh, we can give the renters a little bit money back so they can um, help their kids go to school better, feed them, and then become a more educated workforce. 
um, it, it contribute to that. I know it's the long game. Um, and so you can eventually, you know, you can buy that car made on Friday. And so you have to help the people out. Um, and I, I don't know what to do about, uh, you know, attracting companies. Uh, I wish Ricketts wouldn't sell his and, and then send them away. Um, I just, I just know that there's a problem. Uh, and to speak to that, uh, taxes in, in uh, Texas, I, I, I read a lot, but I forget because of my memory. Um, and, and so that's why I have problems speaking too. Uh, just to let you know, I have trouble finding words. Sometimes you get agitated. But I read an article, something around the Houston area of, of corporate tax incentives uh, that were affecting local school districts. I tried to find it um, while I was, uh, while I was uh, you know, writing stuff down for this. Um, so I, I don't know that uh, Texas, that's a Malthusian you know, state. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, anyway. Uh, so we could use that money to help renters. Maybe we could pay the foster kids their back, the money that they, they, they're they owed. It's not like uh, you don't take money away from them because you can, and because it's been done. I mean, uh, we got some things going on wrong. Um, I just felt like speaking at this one. This is why I came. Um, it's just the, uh, in the principle is how we think about this and how in relation to the previous bill that we can help, uh, the emphasis I think is helping uh, you know, educate uh, our workforce that'll attract business. Because, um, you know, it's funny because uh, uh, China lost some of our, uh, you know, the industry that we sent over there because they didn't have skilled workers. So they, they, we couldn't actually, uh, that's the only reason why uh, uh, they, these companies came back. I don't know, I, I got a lot, of, I, I, didn't, I haven't had time to, to, to form a cogent uh, a, a paper or anything, but um, I guess we have to think about uh, this and, uh, and the people involved. And uh, that's it, any questions? Okay, thank you for your testimony. Any yeah. questions? I just hope it gets listened to, sure. you know, at, at one point. Um, and, and, to, and, and, and to go, um, you know, when I, when I worked and, and paid taxes, you know, I didn't, I didn't moan about how much I paid, but I did moan about how it was spent. And I just didn't, I just came from that kind of household. And so, uh, and I was making, you know, I was, I'm educated and I'm making money and, uh, and I don't know, we just do it. <laughs> thank you. I hope you okay, consider these you. words. Thank you for that. All right. Next opponent testifier. Seeing none, how about any neutral testimony? Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, Nicole Fox, and I see OLE FOX testifying on LB 98 in a neutral capacity on behalf of the Platt Institute. I don't think anyone is going to be surprised to hear me say that reducing the corporate income tax rate is a good economic policy choice for Nebraska. As Senator Friesen has mentioned in the past, because corporations are entities and not people, the cost of the tax is passed through to customers, workers, and shareholders. There are simpler, more transparent, and less economically harmful ways to raise the same revenue. Our high corporate income tax is also part of the reason Nebraska became heavily dependent on tax incentives to offset the disadvantage of doing business here. However, there are at least a couple of reasons that corporate income tax changes would be better accomplished as part of a larger effort for tax reform in Nebraska. The first is how much impact we can make with the change in the tax rate. We're increasingly surrounded by states that are pursuing lower, flatter corporate taxes. Missouri is now at 4%. Colorado may soon drop to 4.4%. And Iowa's governor is seeking to a lower corporate tax rate than this bill proposes. And of course, Wyoming and South Dakota do not have corporate income taxes. The legislature should also want to consider what other states might do in the future and whether this bill will set the state up for success. 
Because corporate income taxes usually represent a smaller share of revenues in most states, the tax can be significantly phased down over time. As one example, North Carolina passed legislation this year to repeal its corporate income tax by the end of the decade. This is noteworthy since North Carolina's corporate income tax was almost as high as Nebraska's before their legislature began with tax reform about 10 years ago. To have this kind of impact, Nebraska likely can't rely on using current revenues alone. There are too many other demands facing the legislature both on the spending and revenue side. And that brings me to my second point, which is how to prioritize which taxes need the Revenue Committee's attention the most right now. Many of our peers are also working on their personal income taxes, at the very same time that attracting workforce and population is a statewide and nationwide economic problem. This suggests a significant effort on personal income tax would be important if Nebraska wants to buy for the growth that will increase Nebraska's tax base well into the future. If the legislature pursued tax modernization or tax reform rather than piecemeal tax relief, that would create the financial flexibility for the state to look more comprehensively at the state's entire tax structure. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Uh, thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, you said to prioritize. What would be the first tax we should prioritize? Well, I th basically what we're saying is that corporate income tax, um, you know, if, if you look at our, the potential to, you know, use revenues for comprehensive tax reform, um, corporate income tax is not as, as a significant share of our state's revenue stream as, say, personal income tax. What would you suggest so. instead of corporate? Where's your, I'm asking, try and find out. Well, I mean, definitely a comprehensive, uh, a com we, 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 we prefer a comprehensive approach, something that is an aggressive comprehensive approach. So we would say, you know, looking at, I mean, we want to look at both the corporate and personal. We'd like to see both be lower and at a, at a much lower rate. So you're saying personal? Personal, though, is definitely a priority, yes. That's, that's what I'm yeah. trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator Pauls. Anyone else? Senator Breezy. Thank you, Senator Breezy. So, I mean, obviously the Platt Institute has worked a lot on what you talk about as comprehensive tax policy, and that's looking at corporate, personal, um, property taxes, all of the above, sales tax, mm -hmm. and trying to develop a more modern tax policy as well. And so I know there's been the blueprint in Nebraska and it's supposed to be our guide. So again, we're, we are trying to piecemeal, you might say, because of the revenue situation we're in now. And so if I heard correctly, the individual rates would impact the most Nebraskans and that would be our priority. Well, I think, you know, again, we want something very comprehensive because our, our entire tax code is outdated. And so if we can look at ways to increase the amount of revenue that we can use for tax reform, you know, we can be much more competitive because so if you first, look at, again, our surrounding states, spending. A, a priority, of course, would be to watch spending too. So we'd have more revenue to, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Senator Friedson. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Mm -hmm. Any other neutral testifiers? <clears throat> Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, Senator Breezy, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for having me today. My name is Adam Timish, A-D-A-M-T-H-I-M-M-E-S-C-H. I'm a professor of law over at the UNL College of Law where I focus on state and local tax matters. Although I should say that at the outset, that the views that I express today are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of the College of Law or the University of Nebraska. Uh, I am here testifying neutral today uh, because I understand that tax rates are obviously a matter of legislative judgment to take into consideration a number of factors. And uh, for, you might be familiar with my prior testimony. I like to stay in my lane a little bit. And my lane is tax policy, not rates. Uh, with that said, um, as somebody who does study state tax systems, I thought that it might be useful to come over today and talk about a few features of state corporate income taxes that can be counterintuitive and that have risen the number of questions that I've heard today. Um, 
in general, the way that the modern state corporate income tax is set up, it makes it a relatively poor avenue to provide direct relief to in-state taxpayers in states like Nebraska um, relative to other types of programs. And it makes it a relatively poor way of providing economic incentives for businesses to relocate, again, as compared to other types of uh, opportunities that you might pursue, whether cuts or spending. The first feature to note in this regard is that corporate income taxes remain completely federally tax deductible. And so immediately 21% of any state tax cut would go to the federal treasury. Um, and that kind of immediately destroys uh, this sort of parity with tax rates. Only about 10% of individuals will itemize and uh, deduct state and local taxes from personal income tax returns. So if you look at the actual effective tax rate here, just on its base, you only a corporation gets 21% back from the federal government when it pays Nebraska state tax. The flip side of that is 21 cents of any tax relief that you provide to a corporation gets paid to the federal government. The rest depends on an allocation of in-state versus out-of-state corporations, as you've heard. Um, it's a reality that the vast majority of corporate income taxes in America are paid by very uh, large national and international companies. Took a look at the most recent IRS data that was available. It was something like 80% of all corporate income taxes were paid by companies with over a billion dollars of receipts uh, in a year. And so this is a tax that is overwhelmingly paid by very large corporations, few of which are headquartered here. They make sales here, uh, but wouldn't be headquartered here. And so when you start thinking about the amount of tax reductions that would stay in Nebraska, the corporate income tax is pretty low on the list uh, as compared to something like personal income tax reform, property tax reform. Um, another rationale that you've heard and some discussion has been about competitive and whether a corporate income tax would allow more competitive, uh, Nebraska be more competitive, incentivize businesses to expand or relocate here. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, I suppose, depending on your take, uh, in the early 90s, Nebraska went to a single factor sales factor method of corporate income tax apportionment which kind of gave away that uh, nationwide states moved to that uh, to not tax corporations based on where the property is located or their payroll is located. And that was the maximum incentive through the normal corporate income tax system that states could provide to locate personnel or property in state. That's why states, including Nebraska, did it. What that does, though, is it means that a corporate income tax rate reduction doesn't really do much other than incentive, you know, maybe General Mills wants to sell more boxes of cereal here, uh, but locating property here, locating payroll here, it doesn't provide any sort of incentive because of that single factor sales factor method of apportionment. So it's just fundamentally a different type of equation. Corporations have to look at things like the personal income tax, property tax, access to energy, technology, transportation, things of that nature. Um, as a final point, I just want to note, you've heard conversation or discussion about this. Obviously, it's a choice of any given level of spending. You've got to raise it from somewhere. And any corporate tax rate reduction removes uh, your ability to reduce other types of taxes that might more directly impact Nebraskans, given these structural aspects that I talked about. So with that, I'm uh, happy to take questions or go away. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Go ahead, Senator Pauls. Thanks. <clears throat> What would, what would you suggest uh, prioritizing, uh, personal or corporate? So I will completely dodge that question uh, in my capacity as a tax scholar, which is how I am uh, testifying. I don't look at, I'm not an economist. I don't look at issues like that. I can tell you that if you want to reduce the taxes paid by Nebraskans most effectively, I would have you look at the Department of Revenue and see what data you have available to see what percentage of taxpayers are Nebraskans. In the corporate context, it's likely a fairly low context uh, percentage of taxes paid by uh, corporations headquartered here. Vast majority of business entities in Nebraska, like nationwide, are not C corporations that would pay this tax. And those that are, are those very large multinational national organizations. So I can't give you, I can give you my personal priority, but I don't have a professional opinion on that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Paul. Senator Breezy. Thank you, Senator Breezy. So um, over the years, I've enjoyed visiting with you and learning more about tax policy. And I know we've, we've talked at length about corporate taxes and whether corporations would locate here or locate in another state. And so could you describe 
situations, I guess, where a corporation would choose to locate in Nebraska, but their sales were probably either national or international and the tax ramifications for them versus a company that's located in Texas and they're doing business in Nebraska and most of their sales are in Nebraska. So how do those two corporations get treated by Nebraska when they're doing business? I'll try to answer that. I did kind of black out after somebody complimented me and saying that a discussion about tax policy was an enjoyable experience. Um, that's the first time I've heard that. So thank you. Um, as far as how we tax, uh, given the single factor sales factor method of apportionment, we only tax based on where your sales are made. So if you are a tech company, for example, making sales across the country, um, your Nebraska tax burden doesn't depend on anything other than the sales that you make in Nebraska. So whether you locate here or elsewhere, your tax burden doesn't change in Nebraska based upon our tax rate, uh, based on that, based on your, your physical location, your expansion here. If you're an out-of-state company selling into Nebraska, right, your taxes would go down based upon the sales in the state, based upon that tax rate change. Um, but your decision of where to locate wouldn't have an effect on that. So would, would you're doing business in Nebraska, if you're located in Texas, mm -hmm. that means you're doing business here. Do you think it would, uh, our high tax policy would hurt their sales in this state? Or would they continue to do business here because we're buying their products? Well, I, I mean, you know, internal uh, economics of firms are different, but assuming you're still making a profit, um, whether you pay a 7% tax and retain 93%, or if you retain 94%, it's still economically advantageous for you to make the sale, right? So the way that we tax is if you make a sale, we tax the, the allocated share of that, right? On the, your taxable income, that percentage. And so for you to exit the market, we would have to be taxing you more than your return from activity here. And so your decision of whether to make sales into the state or not, depending on a 7% tax, six, five, whatever it is, presumably you're gonna make the sale because you wanna keep the 93 cents. But typically a corporation would pass those taxes on along the price of their product here. Uh, you know, so the incidence of the corporate tax is hotly debated. It's split between the capital owners, uh, labor, and um, the pricing customers. And so the split of that would, would depend. Uh, it depends on the unique aspects of the market, the elasticities of demand and supply and things that, again, are not in my field. Um, what you probably do not see is that Apple has a different price in Nebraska now on the MacBook Pro. Uh, price sensitivity uh, to a state corporate income tax. I don't know that we see that firms price differentially across the country based on a 6% or a 5% state corporate income tax. Um, pricing for products is going to depend on so many other factors. Uh, certainly it could come into play, uh, but capital is, a, is usually where a lot of these uh, tax rate reductions would go or corporate income taxes where those would flow. And so there you're looking at how much of the capital owners would be in Nebraska. If you assume equal distribution across the country, we have less than 1% of the country's population. So maybe our equity holders, there's that percentage. Roughly, I think 30 to 40% of uh, corporate equity holders in America are foreign investors. So some of that burden would be born there and some of the benefits. So there are a lot of factors at play and I don't want to get too boring. I've exhausted your, uh, your willingness to say that this was enjoyable. Uh, the, the answer that I would give is it's, it's incredibly complicated. Um, what we do know, though, is that given the single factor sales factor method of apportionment, a firm making sales into the state makes a sale into the state and is taxed effectively on that sale. And the location from which they engage in that activity, it doesn't, fit, it doesn't change that. So relocating here because of a reduction, that's not part of the incentive, except to the effect that it requires increases in other taxes. Right, if it prevents a property tax reduction, then they've got an increased property tax or something along those natures. So all of these things are really intertwined. So as far as attracting companies to the state, really, I mean, an incentive program, um, overall, a low tax policy in general, whether it's personal property, sales tax, would do more to attract those companies than a corporate tax rate. It may. I mean, it depends on what you do with the reduced revenue. I mean, corporations also need infrastructure and workers and access to energy and transportation, things of that nature. 
Um, so it depends on what you do and what you do with revenue. Uh, but as a comparison, what you can track is what a corporate tax rate reduction would do by looking at who is paying the cor current corporate income tax. You would see where those dollars would flow as compared to the benefits you could provide other people in other ways, whether through other tax reductions or direct spending. So if 83% of the tax revenue would leave in the state, there's not going to be much help for Nebraska. And I, I can't speak to those numbers. I'm not an economist, yeah. but it, to the those sound perfectly reasonable based on what I know about the distribution of corporate formation and corporate income. Um, the vast majority would go to corporations and labor uh, and, you know, tax directors who I used to represent who might get a little boost because of their lower effective state tax rate. That's That would go a little bit to labor, probably not in Nebraska. Um, so those are the types of effects at play. For the reasons that I discussed, though, the corporate income tax kind of results in more of those reductions leaving the state than you might see in other areas. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Friesen. Any other questions? <clears throat> but it sounds like the bottom line is that you don't think this should be the priority of ours, but there are a lot of benefits to doing this, though, to Nebraska shareholders, Nebraska consumers, uh, in our rankings, nationwide rankings. So there are there are considerable benefits also, correct? You know, I, I, I mean, there are benefits to everything. Sure. Uh, okay. You know, uh, I'm not a huge fan of rankings as somebody who knows how rankings are done, seeing how the sausage is made on some of those things. Um, the question, I think, is the, the type of impact you can have okay. um, and the, what your ultimate goals are. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, seeing none. Thank you very Great. much Thank for your you. testimony. Any other uh, neutral testifiers? Seeing none, Senator Linehan. Oops. Sorry. Thank you all very much. And I want to thank the chambers for all coming in support to bankers, NFIB, and LIBA. I appreciate them being here. Uh, I understand the Platt Institute is frustrated that we're not doing bigger, 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 um, but it's not the cards this year. Um, I appreciate Mr. Timish being here, but he said several times he's not an economist, he's a lawyer, and I haven't talked to an economist that doesn't say we have a tax problem in Nebraska. Um, Senator Bostart, one thing you asked, and I don't know if it was clear, every conversation I've had, rates matter when companies look where they might move, corporate headquarters, personal, people do look at rates. And it's so easy now because it's all on computers and there's all kinds of studies and we don't do well in any of them. Uh, as far as incentives, I think I've made this clear since I've been here, I, I dislike incentives intensely. <laughs> I would be much, much happier doing what Platt would like us to do is move away from incentives and have a lower rate. And I, we, maybe before I leave, we'll have a chance to do big, big. But this year, this is how much money we have. It's a big deal. And we need to start showing our taxpayers that we can move away from incentives and they can trust us that we're gonna cut their tax rates. So with that. Okay, thank you for that. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you for presenting that to us. And, we have no letters or position statements for the record. And that will close the hearing on LB 938. And at this point, we'll open the hearing on LB 939. So this morning I got up, you know, I, many of you know I'm an early riser. So I got up and I just went to my computer and said, where do I want to live if I care about taxes? So Kiplinger popped up and I think this, I don't know if the state chamber, so I've seen this before. So I think maybe the state chamber has already sent this out. The bottom line for middle income family, we are very unfriendly state. Uh, so we do what it says, while the cost of housing is comparatively low in the Cornhusker state, the average property tax rate in the state is quite high. In fact, the statewide average tax on home is the ninth largest in our U.S. rankings. 
since sales and income taxes are very close to average property taxes, the primary reason why Nebraska is the list of least friendly states. So I get that we still have more work to do on property taxes. But then I, what's the other thing that popped up? And it is a study from Print Friendly. I, it was a whole bunch of them. And right now we have 14 states out of all 50 that have a higher top individual rate than we do. 14. And most of those are New York, Connecticut, where we know the rates are crazy. Um, so what does the bill do? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Luann Linehan, L-O-U-A-N-N-L-I-N-E-H-A-N. I'm here to introduce LB 939. The bill begins a reduction of the top individual rate, which is currently at 6.84%. That top rate kicks in at $33,180 for taxable income for single files, filers and at $64,340 for married joint filers. The top rate hasn't changed since 2002, when it was increased from 6.68%. In 2012, the legislation was, legislation was introduced to reduce all four brackets, or all four rates, I'm sorry, but it passed, but it didn't pass before an amendment was adopted to keep the top bracket at 6.84%. So we all know how that happens. You have an agreement, you get to the floor, and then you lose a couple votes, and the top rate stayed where it was. It's time to reduce the top individual rate. LB 939 would do this over a fairly quick period of only three years. In tax year 2023, we would move it down to 6.34%. Tax year 2024, 6.14%. Tax year 2025, 5.84%. Under LB 938, the top corporate rate would catch up in tax year 2026. This is a companion bill to LB 938. Again, the overarching goal of the two bills is to reduce our top marginal tax rates for both corporate and individual income taxes. We are simply not competitive with surrounding states when it comes to our tax rates. South Dakota and Wyoming have no income taxes. Colorado, Kansas, and Missouri have lower rates than we do. And Iowa, our only neighboring state with an individual rate higher than ours, is working to lower there. I think the governor's goal there is 4% get down to 4%. So even if we did this, we're still going to be the highest in our neighborhood. Many of the same benefits from reducing the corporate rate apply to reducing the individual rate, creates parity between corporations and flow through entities. It's more competitive, gets us better rankings, makes us more attractive, helps attract more businesses and more talent to our state, allows, take, excuse me, <clears throat> allows taxpayers to keep more of the money they make, as a multiplier effect, when residents spend this extra money in the state, if business, if business structures flow through entities have qualified for incentives, which you know many of them do, individual partners or members may have less income tax to pay and therefore some tax incentives may go unused. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for opening. Any questions? <clears throat> Sir Freezer. I think it's no easy. So if, if I'm understanding this correctly, you're not changing any brackets anything you're just taking that top rate moving down okay because i love the idea of a flat rate i do okay. but again i'm trying to match what we it's in the gov all the tax things that we're doing as a revenue committee match pretty closely what the governor said was available so kind of like we did last year get what we can what we got money to do okay thank you thank you senator freezing anyone else no other questions, thank you. Thank you. First proponent testifier. Well, welcome again. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Brian Sloan, B-R-Y-A-N-S-L-O-N-E. I'm the president of the Nebraska Chamber of Commerce and Industry. I'm here on behalf of not only the Nebraska Chamber, but also the Greater Omaha Chamber and the Lincoln Chamber of Commerce. Um, these two are very much companion bills and necessary companion bills, and I'll, I'll try to illuminate uh, the prior discussion with a little, little deeper conversation on this workforce issue. Um, what has transpired in the last three years is a fundamental change in our economy. Um, it's different than anything I've ever seen in the last 30, 40 years. I guess I've been practicing for 40 years now. 
um, and it's here to stay. Um, workforce will be the ter determinant uh, in all of our industries of, of how successful we are, how successful our communities are going forward. Um, the cost structure of our businesses has changed overnight. Uh, immediately before coming to this hearing, I, I uh, taped a show uh, with a with a university economist, and and uh, we talked about the issue of what the cost structure of doing business is going forward. Labor just went up, and it didn't go up temporarily; it went up permanently, um, which is probably a good thing. But for business organizations, their business model in any industry changed overnight. Um, secondly, this technology issue, there is, there's not going to be enough workforce. We have 80,000 jobs open in the state on any given day now. Um, we only graduate 25,000 from high school every year. Even if we retained every single high school student, uh, we could never fill our jobs. Um, there will be a, a big technology investment in every single industry, uh, a so very substantial technology investment. Um, the cost of doing business is going to be very different. Uh, coming out of this pandemic, and it's it's going to be here to stay. Um, Nebraska has an, an incredible ability uh, to be a top 10 growth state in the country if we get this workforce thing right, because we have all sorts of natural advantages from our natural resources to our, the strength of our core industries um, to our quality of life, which suddenly is, is now very, very valuable. Um, but getting this right is, is critical. What does lowering the income tax rate uh, do in that context? And I would say everything. Um, from the standpoint of business, um, it's clearly when we were talking corporations, um, I was talking about some of the larger businesses we have in this state. We represent a lot of the larger businesses, but we also represent hundreds and hundreds of, of small and mid-sized businesses around the state. And they're generally formed as LLCs or, or other flow through organizations and they pay their business tax uh, through through the Nebraska tax system. Um, to be competitive as a state for them uh, is exactly the same issue. Um, also to attract workforce, and I know people will say, well, do young people really look at income taxes? Um, all is all I know is when my son joined the Navy, he suddenly became a resident of Florida. Um, wasn't quite sure how that worked. Um, yes, they do pay attention uh, to taxes, uh, nearly 7% currently on, of your pay is, is, is a lot uh, when you're making low and middle income. Um, this matters. Um, to some of the earlier comments, there is true in the individual side as corporate side when we look at businesses that are flow-throughs. If we were just selling product, and I, I, I think I now understand your question a little bit. If we were just selling product, I understand where you're coming from. The value in our businesses anymore, the value in your farm, and the value in the businesses anymore that we have is increasingly not gonna be in the commodity, it's gonna be in the technology. And the companies that we create and the businesses we create are gonna be creating valuable technology. And the number one reason in, when I was in practice that I didn't put people in corporations is when you, when you have technology in a corporation and now you try to sell that technology, it's where your corporation is as a place of sale. And generally, if you're not leasing it, and the gains that you pay on, on your sale of your subsidiary or whatever you created um, are taxable there. It's no secret why Austin is the technology capital right now. It's no secret why all the California technology companies are moving to Salt Lake. They decrease their individual rates to 4.0 and their corporate rate to 4.0. That's what we're competing with. So I just wanted to put this conversation in context. These two bills need to go hand in hand. These are game changers for Nebraska in a very necessary way, and they will affect our workforce issue pretty dramatically. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Today. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Next proponent testifier. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon again. Acting Chair Breezy, members of the committee, my name is Jerry Stillmock, J-E-R-R-Y-S-T-I-L-M-O-C-K, testifying on behalf of my clients, the National Federation of Independent Business and the Nebraska Bankers Association in support of LB 938. Thank you to Senator Leonard Hand for bringing the measure. And um, um, 
you know, the items of parity, the items of uh, more competition, the, uh, the items of uh, earning money and, and putting it more back in the hands of the taxpayers. Uh, those are all items that we talk about at NFIB and at the Nebraska Bankers Association. And those are the reasons why uh, I'm here this afternoon uh, throwing our support to the measure uh, brought by the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stillmark. Any questions? Thank you. Seeing none, thank you again. For your Very well. Testimony. Thank you, Senators. Good afternoon. Next proponent, testifier. Good afternoon again. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Jessica Shelburne, J-E-S-S-I-C-A-S-H-E-L-B-U-R-N. I'm the State Director of Americans for Prosperity Nebraska. I'm often here in opposition to bills, so this feels really weird, testifying, testifying on two bills as a proponent right away. Um, I don't need to say it again, but I'm going to. We have a tax problem in this state. We all know that. We've talked about it for several years. We are no different than Senator Linehan, the Platt Institute, um, Senator Breezy, Senator Friesen. You've been on this committee for a long time. You've heard us a couple years ago testifying for a more comprehensive approach with the bill that Senator Ben Hansen had brought. We would love nothing more than to go to flat rates, to get rid of incentives, to adjust property taxes, but we understand that taking steps in the right direction is sometimes the best way to get there. And we couldn't agree more with Mr. Sloan when he said, these are companion bills. Nine, eight, or 938 and 939 need to go together. And that could be huge for Nebraska. We hear a lot of senders and folks talking about how much Nebraskans are hurting right now. They've been hurting for the last couple of years. It's been a tough couple of years. We know that. This bill will help those that are struggling. You, let's put this in perspective. You have a first year teacher who's making $33,000 and they're paying the same rate as a CEO of a large company. Now, I'll, I'll be very frank with you didn't pay attention to taxes when I first got out of college. It probably wasn't until I was listening to debate in the legislature when I was a staffer here. <laughs> when I was a struggling single parent living paycheck to paycheck and discovered that I was one of those that was barely in that top bracket, but paying the same rate as a large CEO. So if you wanna do something for Nebraskans, Lower this rate, take steps in the right direction, help Nebraskans put more money in their pockets so that they can pay for their rent, so that maybe they can save for a house, they can get clothes for their kids, they can put food on their table. Maybe this will allow them to go out and do something fun, take a vacation with their kids. These are steps that you can take right now. I never thought I'd be saying this at this point in time, but I was wrong. Our economy has not taken the hit like I honestly thought it would. I've sat in this committee and said, at some point, we're going to take a hit. We have not seen that. Our revenues are strong. This is the time for this committee to take action. Send this to the floor of the legislature and let's help Nebraskans. Thank, thank you for your testimony. Any thank questions? You. Senator Friesen. Thank you, Senator Breezy. What what is the average income in Nebraska? I couldn't tell you that right offhand, but okay. I want to say it's in like the fifty six range. But I can check and get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to know what the average is and what the tax savings would be. Nobody has really talked about the numbers there yet. What the average person would get in the tax rate. But I think that's important when people are hearing you talk about. Uh, what this is going to do for the average working person. And you hit it right on the head, I think, is is our top bracket too low to where you, the top bracket is hitting the average person mm -hmm. versus a bracket that's set up differently. 
I think that's a fair question. And I'm more than happy to look into that and get you the numbers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, mm -hmm. Senator Breezy. Senator Bolstar. Thank you, Senator Breezy. Thank you for coming in today. Um, you talked about how ultimately what you are in favor of is a flat rate tax. I guess I'm not understanding. So at the same time, the complaint was made that a CEO was paying the same tax rate as a teacher, mm -hmm. but isn't isn't so that ultimately exactly what you're looking the, for? The one thing that I did not state in that is if we went to a flat rate, increasing those deductions for those that are in that lower income. Um, and that's, I mean, we've looked at economic modeling and I would be more than happy to sit down with you and share some of that with you. Um, I'd appreciate that. Okay. I will. I, and, and I guess, what, so in sort of, and thank you for the, the context to add there. Um, that was throwing me off. And um, I, I, this should be a further conversation that we should have, but a flat rate with further deductions, wouldn't that essentially just simulate a progressive tiered taxation system? Or am I, am I misunderstanding? I'm not 100% sure how to answer you on that one. Okay. So let's, let's schedule a time. I'm more than happy to sit down and talk with you and and iron some of this out. But what I will say is we want to grow the state. You mentioned that earlier. Absolutely. In, in order to grow our, our youth here, we need to become more competitive. And we have to do something about that. And when all the states around us have lower rates for income tax, for the corporate rates, so businesses aren't wanting to necessarily come here. We have to have the incentive programs. It doesn't create a climate that allows us to grow. And like Mr. Sloan said, we have a great state. We need to create a climate that will entice people to come here. And if we do that, I think that we solve a lot of the problems. You have more people, there's more in folks paying taxes, there's more money in our economy, and it's a win-win for everyone. I would say that I think we want the same thing. Yes, it's and, just a matter of how we get there. And I appreciate you answering these questions. Thank you, Senator Poster. Senator Albright. I thought I would just um, help you out so you don't have to look okay. this up. I think Senator Friesen had asked um, what the average was of the 2019 number. Is that what you had? Yeah. Of thirty-one thousand nine thirty-three and a couple at sixty-one thousand four thirty-nine. So we're pretty close. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no other questions. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next proponent testifier. Any other proponents? Any opponent testifiers? Well, welcome again. Thank you, Senator Breezy. Members of the Revenue Committee, my name is Craig Beck, that's C-R-A-I-G-B-E-C-K, and I'm the Senior Fiscal Analyst at Open Sky Policy Institute. We're here today testifying in opposition to LB 939 because it would disproportionately benefit the highest paid Nebraskans without any guaranteed economic growth. Uh, I think some of the dialogue so far, uh, I'll hopefully be able to provide a little bit of context for that. So as you can see from the handout that's making its way around, this measure would cut taxes for the wealthiest Nebraskans without offering much help for lower and middle income families. The average tax cut across the 80% of Nebraskans paid less than $125,000 per year would be $62.75. I'm, I'm gonna say that again. So the average tax cut across the 80% of Nebraskans paid less than $125,000 per year would be $62.75. For the highest 1% of Nebraskans, the cut is 142 times greater at $8,904 annually. The more than $360 million this will cost the state by fiscal year 27 
is very unlikely to come back to the people in the state via economic growth. For one, changing the tax code is not going to draw thousands of people to Nebraska. Research has not found a conclusive link between taxes and migration. And furthermore, the idea that cutting taxes can drive growth in general is undermined by the experiences of Wisconsin and Minnesota, two remarkably similar states in terms of populations, demographics, culture, and industry composition. Yet in 2010, they headed down divergent paths with Wisconsin cutting taxes and shrinking government and Minnesota raising the minimum wage, strengthening its safety net and increasing investments in infrastructure and education paid for by tax increases largely falling on the wealthy. As of 2017, on virtually every metric, Minnesota workers and families were better off than their counterparts in Wisconsin, according to an Economic Policy Institute report. Minnesota saw stronger growth in jobs, wages, median health, household income, overall economic growth, growth per worker, and population growth. And despite raising taxes on the wealthy, Minnesota saw no erosion of its income tax base or the taxable income of its wealthy residents, both of which actually grew in the three years following the increase. Wisconsin, on the other hand, lagged the national average across most of these metrics and experienced a net population loss. And as we've said, we understand that we are in a unique revenue circumstance right now, but would nonetheless urge extreme caution in implementing measures like this that cut such significant amounts of future revenues. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Any, any questions? Senator Bostar. Thank you, Senator Breezy. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. Uh, how much income do you need to make in order to start paying taxes into our top <coughs> bracketed tier? Sure, so uh, for a married uh, filing jointly taxpayer, uh, it would be somewhere around $78,000. I can get you that exact number. It's lower for uh, single filers, but to that top bracket, the, the top mark, or excuse me, the, the top bracket that is in statute, you have to add the standard deduction. That's where you get uh, the, the standard deduction for married filing jointly taxpayers is roughly $13,000. So $13,000 plus the top income level that that 6.84% that bracket kicks in at is where. And for an individual? Uh, it would be, uh, the standard deduction is 6,750, I think. So roughly 38,000, 39,000, somewhere in there. I can get those specific numbers to you, Senator. Thank you. I think... You know, I, I, you know, obviously, with a sh very strict interpretation of the word, you know, highest income earners, this tax definitely does impact them disproportionately to others because we're not doing anything to we'll give the brackets or anything. Correct. But, you know, someone making in the 30 whatever thousand dollars a year as an individual. I'm just not sure about the characterization of, of saying, you know, of saying that this is, this would be specifically a tax deduction targeted to the wealthiest Nebraskans when we're talking about people who fundamentally aren't making very much money. Um, now, and, you know, as we go through and we evaluate all these things, my intention is to put the limited resources of the state into what will have the largest impact. Um, but I don't, that's just sort of my, feedback on where this is targeted. Now, my position is that the, the where our brackets are don't make any sense whatsoever. Um, and that earning 30 something thousand dollars a year doesn't seem to make, it, there's no logical reason for that to equate to the highest tax bracket we have. Is, do you have a, is that normal to have your top bracket start so low? Uh, you know, Senator, I cannot answer that question right now. I can definitely look into that and get back to you. Um, I think from our perspective, uh, first off, those those income rates that are advertised that the top income kicks in at are higher than, than they are, in fact, in statute. So that's one. And then two, uh, just the fact that this tax cut only touches the top bracket uh, means by definition that it will only flow to the people who pay at that high rate. Uh, as we've shown in our modeling, uh, the, the impact on particularly the wealthiest 1% of Nebraska taxpayers, 
vastly outpaces what would be afforded to uh, the, the individuals or, or families that you are talking about at those lower income levels. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bostar. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony thank you. here today. Any other opponent testifiers? Seeing none, anyone wishing to testify in a neutral capacity? Thank you. Good afternoon again. Good afternoon. Nicole Fox, N-I-C-O-L-E-F-O-X, representing the Platt Institute and testifying on LB 939 in a neutral capacity. While we applaud efforts to reduce income taxes, we are concerned that this bill does not provide the best means to reduce tax burden on our workforce and improve Nebraska's economic competitiveness. In 2021, the Platt Institute became an alliance partner with Blueprint Nebraska and has worked in concert with Blueprint's leadership to develop and promote a comprehensive framework for bold and sustainable tax modernization. This plan was developed through gathering insights from Nebraskans and by conducting independent economic analysis on the impact the plan would have on our workforce and economic growth. Particularly, tax modernization should be deliberate in focusing on reforms that significantly increase our competitiveness with peer states, incentivize our recent graduates to remain in Nebraska, and encourage more people to migrate to our state and join our workforce. Tax modernization, as opposed to piecemeal tax relief, is necessary to achieve these objectives. Changes to our tax system must be bold and sizable enough to generate economic growth and to sustain Nebraska's other financial commitments, which includes property tax relief. For example, by strategically broadening our sales tax base and removing preferences from our tax code, we can produce new revenues to support significant and sustainable tax reform. We believe these features of tax modernization are essential to the prosperity of our state and are best provided for in LB 1264, the, the Blueprint Nebraska plan that will be heard in this committee in the coming weeks. And just as an example, uh, the teacher example that was discussed earlier, uh, a teacher making $33,000 under the Blueprint plan, that teacher would pay no taxes under LB 1264. With the state's strong financial position, now is the time to boldly reform the state's tax code and to rethink the underlying incentives of Nebraska's tax structure. Tax modernization would make Nebraska a better place to earn a paycheck at any level, to own property or a business, and to retire. And with that, I'm happy to address any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? <laughs> Seeing none, thank you again. Anyone else wishing to testify in the neutral capacity? Seeing none, Senator Linehan, would you like to close? Thank you all. Um, again, I want to thank the Omaha, Lincoln, and State Chambers for being here and the Nebraska Bankers for being here very much. Uh, on the open sky thing, Senator Boster, I think you were making the point, but I just want to you, you can't cut taxes for people that don't pay taxes, income taxes. And I, some of these, the lowest 20 or the second 20, they're not, hopefully they're actually getting refundable tax credits back. So it, I agree. As far as, now I'm gonna go to, it's open sky and blueprint, makes sense. Blueprint, I, I know that their plan, and I like this, but there is not enough money to do it right now if we have to keep, because I think we've discovered as committee, you gotta do something for everybody. You can't just do income taxes or just do property. You need to do it. So their plan would have, uh, and we'll hear this from Senator McDonald, they would, anybody making 50,000 or less wouldn't pay income taxes. Family would under 100, 100 or less wouldn't pay income taxes. But to pay for that, they put taxes on food and medicine. So it, it's kind of a wash. I, I don't know. I, I'm not saying I'm against it, but it's we don't have we don't have the people in the right places right now to do big reform. So I think this is, and I maybe we do the brackets too, Senator Friesen. I have to look what that costs. This is simple. It seems like simple when we get the floor. Simple is always easy. 
And as we also all know, what we send the floor is not usually what we get at the end. So I'm trying to make it simple and then and we can talk about when we exit. But thank you all very much. I'll thank questions. I'm sorry. I think we have a question over here. Senator Bolstar. Thank you, Senator Breezy. And just uh, just to put on the record, because I asked the question and thank you for the information that you handed me. <clears throat> there are nine states that have a uh, that have income taxes that have a income tax top bracket that is lower than ours. So every other state either doesn't have an income tax or their top brackets go higher, which makes sense to me. Right. So one of the things I didn't pass out, but if you're, I think if you're a family at 80,000, you're better off living in California than you are in Nebraska. But then if you're making a million, you, you don't want to live in California. Right. So, uh, <laughs> There, and again, we'll yeah. exact. We'll go through it. But right now, we we are not competitive in all right. our. And you know, you have young friends, family, young people look at taxes when they decide where they're going to live. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Bostar. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you for that. Thank you, Senator Linehan. And we have no uh, letters or submit submitted uh, position papers on LB 939 and that will close the hearing on LB 939. Well, thank you all. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, cameras off while we wait. Mike's off.
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are you ready for me? Uh, yeah, we're ready. Okay. Whew. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Linehan and members of the Revenue Committee. For the record, I am Michaela Cavanaugh, M A C H A E L A C A V A N A U G H, representing District 6, West Central Omaha, Douglas County. Last year, I had a conversation with Chairwoman Linehan about the need to address income tax in our state. At that time, I said I was committed to cutting income taxes for the middle class. I had introduced LB 832 as a means to achieving this goal. LB 832 begins by cutting the current lowest tax bracket, merging the next two tax brackets at the lower rate and adding two one half percent increase, sorry, still out of breath a little bit, increases in newer, higher tax burdens. This would become effective in 2023. The largest benefit would flow to the low and middle income folks. And looking at the economic impact of how our current tax income tax structure is working, the lowest wage earners are proportionally paying significantly more in income taxes while also struggle to provide for themselves and their families. This bill will keep more money in their pockets and hopefully more food on the table. And that's pretty much it. So I'm happy to take any questions you have. Okay, I'm sorry. Another question <laughs> like a minute. Seeing none. Okay. Do we have proponents? I don't think we do. Do we have any proponents? <laughs> do we have any opponents? <laughs> Okay, I have one opponent. I'm going, I have to go close in another hearing. So okay. I, I am okay. waiting closing. Can I ask her some questions then? Ask me? Okay? So I don't understand. So you're dra is this, I'm looking at the fiscal note and trying to figure out. Yes. You're saying, so up to. Do you want me to walk through it quickly? I can't. Yeah. Okay. So I'm eliminating the lowest tax bracket. So if you are an individual, that would be. Anybody who makes under 3,339 filing jointly $6,659. Um, and then if you make over the 3,339, then your first, the first tax bracket would start at 3.51% up to an income of 32,000 for single, 64,000 for filing jointly. The next tax bracket, 6.84% would be 32,000 to 99,000 um, for single and 64,000 to 199,000 for joint. Then we start a new tax bracket at 100 or at 200,000 for a joint and 100,000 for single. And then we had another tax bracket at 1 million and over for single, 2 million for joint. Okay, I'm looking at the fiscal amount and I don't quite Um, did you study the fiscal note? I did, but it was, <laughs> let's see here. I don't know how you lose revenue on this. Oh, yes, That's you do. Mm -hmm. yeah. You definitely do. Um, back to my opening statement. You lose revenue because when you stop taxing poor people, that's where we get most of our money. Actually, Michaela, that's not right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, that's okay. It um so that is why just, so we it, when we shift the tax, even though we raise the tax on the highest level, a million above or two million above, we still are losing a significant amount by the tax change for the lowest income. Okay. All right, I'm not, I'm not going to keep you from closing yeah. in, no. in the judiciary, but... I, and I can send you the numbers of what we lose at each tax bracket or gain at each tax bracket, and I apologize. Open Sky just handed us something. Yes, they have it in there, um, and I apologize I didn't... That's okay. That's okay. Have that with me. Go we'll close your other one. <laughs> I'm sorry. You have to show on you, right? I do, yes, I have. Okay. Okay. I have a musical performance from first grade. It's a very, very busy day today. I am okay. apologize, but yes, You're fine. it does eliminate... A significant amount of income at the lower levels, and it does not make up enough income at the higher levels. But I chose not to increase the higher levels to balance it out because I didn't think that that was appropriate either. But it's a starting point for a conversation, and we can always discuss further 
what other changes we could make. Okay. I'd be happy to partner with you on that. Okay, thank you, Senator. Thank Taylor. you very I much. Very much. Okay, there are no proponents, opponents. Chair Linehan and members of the committee, my name is Brian Sloan, B-R-Y-A-N-S-L-O-N-E. I'm the president of the Nebraska Chamber of Commerce. I'm here on behalf of Nebraska Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Greater Omaha Chamber, and the Lincoln Chamber today um, to testify in opposition to this bill, and I'll, I'll try to keep this relatively brief. Um, very much... Um, I'll use an analogy that I probably shouldn't use, but I will. Um, when I joined the chamber three years ago, we had an office that was built in 1964, and I, I won't have, it wasn't the landlord's fault, it was our fault. We never updated it for those who would, were in my old office. Um, the entry was uh, up a pair of steps right into the restrooms um, with carpet that hadn't been changed since 1964, and uh, my desk and table and conference room which had been changed. And that was the front door to Nebraska for companies from all over the country and all over the world who would come in and, and were thinking about investing in Nebraska. Uh, for those of you who've been to our new offices, that became uh, a, a necessary item uh, because very much the chamber is the front door uh, for a lot, of, a lot of companies and a lot of people from other countries uh, when they consider them, what they think about Nebraska. The fact of the matter is that our top tax rates are the front door to Nebraska when, when businesses and workers consider Nebraska. Say what you will, they don't look at the brackets, they don't look at anything else, and particularly when our brackets start at, at 30 some thousand dollars for an individual, our top tax rates are our front door. Um, this legislation would, would basically close the front door. Uh, and, and say, at the point that any individual makes $100,000, you would be deemed rich. Um, and therefore, your taxes would not only be the rate that we now charge, which is one of the most highest in the country, but we're going to add an additional percent almost uh, to that rate for making $100,000. Um, that's not a front door that, that's, that's going to be attractive. Um, I, we do like... Uh, the consideration, uh, and I think long term for this committee, uh, in years as we go forward, we need to think about the brackets of people, particularly under the current system. Um, some of the heavier tax uh, individuals in our state are seventy-five thousand to two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars, and those are those are some of the very types of, of young professionals that we're looking to bring into the state. Um, and so Senator Cava has, has tried to address some of that, um, but the, the, the rates in, in her bracket four and five, beginning at 100,000, would, uh, would again close the front door to the state. And so we are in opposition to this legislation. I would be happy to take any questions. Yes, thank you. Are there any questions from the Thank you for being here. Thank you. Next opponent. Good afternoon, Nicole Fox, and I see OLE, FOX, Director of Government Relations for the Platt Institute, and I'm testifying in opposition to LB 832. We oppose this bill because it's bad policy. LB 832 adds two tax brackets above our current highest 6.84% personal income tax bracket. LB 832 would impose a 7.75% tax on incomes of greater than $100,000 per year and impose an 8.25% tax on those with incomes greater than $1 million. Currently, the only states that levy a higher tax rate on incomes of $1 million or more are California and New York, along with the District of Columbia. States levying higher taxes on income greater than $100,000 include those same states in addition to Hawaii, Minnesota, Oregon, and Vermont. New Jersey levies 8.9% on incomes over $500,000. Two of our border states, South Dakota and Wyoming, have no income tax. And this November, Colorado voters may potentially adopt a flat 4.4% personal income tax rate. 
Governor uh, Kim Reynolds in Iowa is proposing a lo to lower the state's personal income tax rate to a flat 4%. The Platt Institute's policy director, Sarah Curry, participates in monthly calls with a network of state tax policy experts. This working group includes state think tank policy researchers from across the country and the Tax Foundation. During her December 2021 monthly call, 20 states reported that their governors or legislatures would be introducing legislation to reduce income taxes, either personal, corporate, or both. Some of these states had already passed legislation to cut income tax in 2021, and some are looking to completely phase out income tax, most notably Missouri. If the goal is to grow Nebraska's economy by attracting and retaining more residents, imposing the proposed income tax rates in LB 832 will not get us there. While this bill's intent is to target the wealthiest in our state, the unintended consequences is that it will also put additional pressure on small businesses in Nebraska that file through the individual income tax. Most businesses today are passed through ent entities where the owner passes on profits through their individual income tax returns. We would be imposing a significantly higher tax rate on our small local businesses who are the backbone of our state's economy in many of our communities. Many Nebraska businesses have already been negatively affected by the pandemic and also by current high inflation rates. So why would we burden them further? We need to instead foster the growth of small businesses who are our job creators. Furthermore, a high tax rate on higher income earners is an economically and fiscally harmful policy because it is a tax on a highly mobile group of people who earn less in bad economic times. Enacting such a tax uh, such a tax makes tax, state tax revenue more volatile and unpredictable. When high income earners flee to lower tax states, this puts more pressure on middle class families to pay for even more of state government. Earlier this month, the Platt Institute published an article discussing how Nebraska lost more residents than it gained due to migration in 2021. The pandemic has prompted a lot of people to take a hard look at where they want to live and work. People living in high tax states who can work remotely are choosing to move to low tax states. Research by the Tax Foundation confirms this. There are ways to raise revenue and lower taxes for middle-class Nebraskans that don't require making Nebraska's tax code less competitive with other states. Platt Institute would like to see tax modernization that makes Nebraska's tax code simpler and more attractive for businesses to promote economic growth. LB 832 does neither, and I ask that you hold the bill in committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions from the committee? Thank you very much for being here, Ms. Fox. Are there opponents? Uh, good afternoon again. Bud Seinhorst, B U D S Y N H O R S T, President and CEO of the Lincoln Independent Business Association. I appreciate your time today to uh, deliver this testimony in opposition of LB 832. Uh, I agree, concur with the previous testifiers on their opposition. Uh, passage of LB 832 would be a detriment to the progress this legislature is trying to make with regard to our tax structures. It's important that senators push for more reasonable income tax rates and not to punish those who earn more. This bill will limit investment in our communities decrease the size of our economy and stifle the creation of jobs. In light of this detrimental effect, in light of the detrimental effects of COVID on our economy that crippled and even closed many of our local small businesses who are just now starting to recover, the timing of this proposal could not be worse on our business community. The income tax is already among the most progressive taxes we pay as citizens. Raising the income tax rate will have a negative effect and impact on individuals and our economy. <laughs> LB 832 will reduce the amount of money business owners have to grow their operations and create jobs, reduce the number of individuals seeking to become entrepreneurs, and decreasing the amount of capital consumers have to spend at local establishments. As I stated earlier, we rate 35th on the Tax Foundation's 22 state, 2022 state business tax climate, an unfortunate marker for our state. Nebraska needs to identify creative ways to cut spending and ease tax burdens, not just raise taxes on these citizens. LB 832 as presented will make a less competitive state, 
Attracting and retaining businesses and talent in our state is a major priority. By raising taxes, we send the wrong message to those who want to come to our state, start a business, and raise a family. Business owners have had an incredibly tumultuous few years, and Liba feels it is the duly the duty of our elected officials to do what they can to create an environment of opportunity and demonstrate a growth mindset. For these reasons, we encourage opposition and uh, leaving LB 832 in committee. I appreciate your time today and would be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Seeing none, thanks. Thank you very much. Engaged. Other opponents? Anyone wanting to testify in the neutral position? Good afternoon, Chairwoman Linehan and members of the Revenue Committee. My name is Craig Beck, that's C-R-A-I-G-B-E-C-K, and I'm the Senior Fiscal Analyst at Open Sky Policy Institute. We're here in a neutral capacity on LB 832 because while we appreciate the progressivity of many of the changes, we have concerns about the overall revenue loss that would result. I will deviate a bit here. Uh, so Senator Linehan, to your question earlier about uh, why there was such significant revenue loss, uh, I think you figured it out, but our modeling indicates that uh, the elimination of that first bracket, um, as well as the combining of the second and third brackets would result in a $240 million revenue loss. Um, and then the, uh, the amount of money that is raised from the additional two brackets just doesn't pay for the, the amount of revenue that, that is lost as a result. How much does it raise? The additional bracket above 100,000 at the seven, or for single 200,000 MFJ at the 7.75 rate, $101 million annually. And this is, uh, again, from the Institute on Taxation uh, and Economic Policy. Um, and then the high earner bracket would raise $8 million annually. So by eliminating the lowest, as I I just went through that. Uh, we expand. We support expanding the brackets to higher income since the top taxpayers in Nebraska have very high adjusted gross income and pay a relatively low effective rate on such income. According to the most recent Nebra Na excuse me, Nebraska tax burden study published by the Department of Revenue, the 500 tax returns reporting the highest incomes in the state paid an effective tax rate of just 3.82% in 2018 and had an average adjusted gross income of nearly $6.4 million. However, uh, as can be seen from the fiscal note, the increased revenue that comes from the new brackets isn't enough for the proposal to reach revenue neutrality. Uh, and so we cannot support the bill as written. Uh, I do also wanna take a second just to clarify some of the comments that Senator Bostar and I had on that last exchange as they apply to this bill as well. I will follow up with him as he is obviously not here. Um, the top income rate that, that we apply to in the state of Nebraska under our personal income tax code only kicks in above the top income in that rate. So uh, we always look to the tax burden study, which is published by the Department of Revenue. Um, in 2018, the first seven deciles of the state of Nebraska, so the first seven, the lowest seven deciles in, in Nebraska taxpayers paid an effective tax rate of 1.91%, so nowhere near close to that 6.84% top marginal rate. The Similarly, I, I think it's interesting to point out that the top 500 returns, so the 500 wealthiest returns, paid 3.82%. And again, this comes from the Department of Revenue. I'd be happy to send it to the committee. That also, interestingly, uh, is the top 500 have a lower effective tax rate than the top, the top 10th decile, which is 495 largely due to tax incentives um, is the assumption there. So uh, thank you, Senator Linehan. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm not a fond of, fond of that study, but that's it. Are there any questions? Uh, thank you for breaking this down. I'm gonna ask that the Department of Revenue breaks this down for us to see how this works. Uh, I, I think I was confused. So you, this is the, this is after their deductions, their yeah, that's tax deductions. Right. So you get what did you say? What? Well, you know, I can't find a place to have this conversation. Any other questions? Getting worn down. Thank you.
Thank you. No worries. Thank you, Senator Lenahan. Anyone else wanting to testify in the neutral position? Okay, we had one letter uh, or one, I guess, letter for the record, right? Comment. Uh, proponent Robert Kallstrom. And with that, we'll close the hearing on LB 832. Thank you all very much for being here. Appreciate it. Well, it was painful. We got in here. Four o'clock.